All right, does anybody have one last question they would like to ask before we call it a night? Uh huh. It's okay. All right, so we'll do the best that I can. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Beasts that are not by two. Yeah, Genesis, so go to the book of Genesis, please, and we'll look at chapter 7, please. We're going to look at the book of Genesis, chapter 7, and Genesis, chapter 6. We're going to look at Genesis, chapter 7, and Genesis, chapter 6. Now remember, God always has reasons. That's why he would curse the fig tree, create the cherubims that way, because he's trying to show you some meaning right there, his intention for it. So why would he put seven creatures in two? We're going to look at Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1. So we're talking about Noah's ark right here. So then uh, I'm going to try to draw some kind of creature here. So let's draw a giraffe, for example, maybe. So let's draw a giraffe. And then with this giraffe right here, and he got some spots on him, right? Something like that. <laughs> got a long neck right here. Something like that. So, <laughs> something like that, something like that. It's kind of a skinny snout, but oh well. All right. But anyways, with this giraffe right here, <clears throat> So with this giraffe, or this Nephilim that I just drew, <laughs> this weird little creature that I just drew, God mentions, of every clean beast, thou shalt take thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean, by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by seven, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. So he already gave you an explanation one at verse three. It's to keep the seed alive. So then for unclean, why would, he to, why would he do two, not one? Simple, to create seed. You, you notice he mentioned male and female, right? So there's your answer for two, for unclean. So because it's unclean, it shows how much God doesn't really approve of this. So because he doesn't really approve of this, that's the reason why he'll have them uh, at a smaller number, too. But then with clean animals, he likes those better. So with clean animals, because he likes those better, he wants it at a higher number. But now here's the question, why is it that he would want seven? Why would he want seven to be clean? The verse actually explained it to you already. Verse 4, 4, see, giving the explanation, yet what? Seven days. And I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. God did that to represent seven days. Where he's going to do it real soon. Now notice how many days? Now when God created the whole universe, why did he stop at seven? He had a reason for that. So look at the book of Genesis. Chapter 2. There's something about the seventh that is valuable to him. Genesis chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 2 through 3. There's your answer. Scripture with scripture. Seven days. Why would he do this seven day thing? Based off of Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 through 3. He gave you the answer. The Bible says right here, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God, what? Blessed the seventh day and what? Sanctified it. See, it's something holy. It's uh, something special. Because that in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So seven is the number, is representing God's number or completion. It's God's number. Now think about this, look at 2 Peter. I could finish it right here and call it a night, but I want to give you some deeper meaning. Would you like that? Yeah. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Let's get into interesting stuff right here. I would highly recommend people to read the booklet, 
Seven Sevens by Dr. Peter S. Ruffin, Seven Sevens. Very, very amazing. And he'll tell you about the timing. He goes to the beginning of creation to the timing of the rapture, timing of the millennium and second advent. He puts it all in a uh, clock based on seven, which is very interesting. So, but anyways, we're not going to get into that. That's a whole not another different teaching. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. We'll look at verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a what? A thousand years and a thousand years as what? So to who? The Lord. Genesis 2, verse 2 through 3. Was that to humans or was that to the Lord? The Lord, right? Seventh-day Adventists, they claim this is a passage proving that we had the Sabbath. Do you honestly believe that, let's use some common sense, Adam and Eve at the Garden of Eden, they were like, oh, let's observe the Sabbath day right here since it's Saturday. <laughs> no, they walked and talked with God every day. So obviously the Sabbath did not exist at that time as much as Seventh-day Adventists would like to argue. It said to God, to God. That's a key reason. And if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you're going to lose an advanced revelation right here, an amazing revelation, a golden nugget. If we think of this to God, then it makes sense with 2 Peter 2 and the book of Genesis chapter 6 and 7. By the way, what chapter is this in Genesis? Isn't this interesting? So with 777, he mentions right here, it's to who? Him, right? His point of view, not us. That's why we don't understand his number, why he does it. Because to him, he has something else in mind. To him, it's something sanctified, completed, special to him. Now, when you base it off of 2 Peter chapter 3, a day to the Lord, to the Lord, is a thousand years, as a thousand years is to what? One day. That's how God sees his timetable. That's why it makes sense when this is evidence when you read prophecy. Daniel's 70th week, his calendar. Do you honestly mean that, do you honestly believe it's only 70 weeks long? No, to God, it's a different number right there. So, think about this throughout the past 6,000 years of human history, almost 6,000 years. Wait, wait a minute. You notice I said six? That means we're really close somewhere. So then, when, you, when we go right here, we've been through here 2,000. And then through Usher, Schofield's timeline, they approximately put it to 4,000 B.C. around there. So obviously it's not exactly 4,000, exactly 2,000, but a rough estimate. This is why you got to watch out rapture date setting stuff. you got to avoid that because you can't pinpoint an exact timeline here because you're going to be off by, you're going to be off by quite a few number of years. Now, if people like to get us on that one, if some scientists and atheists like to get us Christians on that, hey, man, you hypocrite, you date a fossil by how many million year gap? This is somewhere between 60 million to 100 million years old. Well, that's a 40 million year gap, man. So look who's the one that's in trouble, all right? You critique us concerning this one about scripture. You're so nitpicky on a, certain, on a, a little day that you're millions of years off, you guys. Okay, now, anyway, right here, 4,000, 2,000. The millennium, how long does it last? Oh, wow. And, ta and what did the Bible say when you turn to Revelation chapter 21, 22, and Revelation chapter probably 7? Time shall be no more. Wow. Wow. Because what's the number of completion? Ooh, that's why we can predict a rough estimate about the rapture right here. Interesting, is it not? Do you see why I, do you see why I don't fall for a lot of the rapture date setting videos out there? Because this is something that I knew a long time ago called seven sevens. I just never taught that yet because I want to make it more specific to the people. But see, this is very telling right here, see? And then the millennium is a thousand years long. How does this add in total, folks? And what does God complete everything by? Let's all dismiss with a word of prayer.